Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. Do you have a Bible this morning? The sixth division of the book of Acts is where we will begin and spend some time today. Acts chapter 6 will be our beginning place. And while you're opening your Bible and getting settled, we welcome all of you, along with the sentiment that Jim expressed a moment ago. Welcome. We have an awful lot of folks who are visiting with our church family today. A lot of that is because of some activities down the street. And so we have a lot of young people who are here today because of Falcon Days. And we welcome you. Some of you have your parents with you. And so we welcome all of you to our assembly today. Glad that you can be with us and hope that you profit from our time together. And those of you who are joining us via live stream, welcome, whether you're in Tampa Bay or some other part of these United States or some other part of this world. Thank you for being a part of our assembly this morning. It's great to see everybody today. Glad you're with us. Should have received a family report as you came in. On the back side of that, if you're new to us, there's an outline there where you can take some notes as we make our way through our material. Or if you go to our website, there is an interactive outline that you can use there that will help you as we go through the material that we're going to look at today. I wanted to ask among the college students, Truth, are you here this morning? Truth Clevenger, are you in this service this morning? This is part of the problem with our split service. And so Truth is not here. He placed membership with us this week and wanted to say just a word about him. He'll be in our next assembly, I'm sure. Sure is good to see all of you today. Glad that we can study together. If you're visiting with us today, could I just say to you that uh, what we're going to be doing this morning is a little bit different than typical. In fact, it's far different than what we would typically do on a Sunday morning, because today we're going to begin the process of selecting and ultimately appointing some additional deacons to serve our church family. Now, we went through this process earlier this year in regard to shepherds, and we added two shepherds to the 12 men who are already serving. And so now we look to add some additional deacons to help those 14 shepherds and to serve our church in a very special way kind of capacity. And so as we talk about that this morning, again, that's very different than what we would typically do on Sunday morning, but hopefully it will be beneficial to you. And I would imagine perhaps uh, for some of our young people who are visiting with us, perhaps you've not gone through this process with the church, maybe where you are. And so hopefully this will all be beneficial and helpful to all of us as we study together today. When the father-in-law of Moses came to visit him, he told him, what you're doing is not good. You've taken so much upon yourself that you're going to exhaust yourself. And his very wise counsel was that you need some help. You need to select, you need to appoint, and you need to authorize some men to help you in this work. And his counsel was, they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Now that was very wise counsel because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how talented you may be because human capacity is limited. Any given man or group of men can do only so much and no more. And beyond that point, work either doesn't get done or it gets done in an inferior kind of way. And so we have to have individuals sometimes to help us. The Lord Jesus did that. And so Jesus came into the world and he chose on one occasion 70 assistants to send out on what we call the limited commission. And then later, as you know, he chose 12 and he sent them on what is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. And I want you to notice that in both of those circumstances, with Moses and with Jesus, that there was no plan B. That these individuals either did their work and it was done and done in an efficient way, in an effective way, or the work was not going to get done. Elders in a local church, of course, have not, not always been quite as wise as Moses and Jesus about that. And yet... And yet, no group of men, no matter how competent they are, no matter how talented or dedicated they may be, can do everything that needs to be done. And so, in a local church, we have these special servants, these wonderful men who serve our church family as deacons. That very concept is interesting to me because it is <clears throat> the, word, the word deacon is used in, in uh, at least two very specific kinds of ways in the New Testament. I'm sorry. Let me put, go back there. What you're, what, I'm, what you're seeing on the screen and what I'm seeing are not exactly matching up. There we go. Okay. The word is used in at least two specific senses in the New Testament. 
in the first place that it's used in the sense that all Christians are servants. Now, we understand that, don't we? From John chapter 12 and beginning in verse 26, when Jesus said, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, that where I am, my servant will also be. And if anyone serves me, my father will honor him. Well, Jesus was a servant. And the Bible uses that terminology for Paul and Peter and Barnabas and Apollos, that these were all servants of the Most High God. But the word is also used in a very specific kind of way. And it's used of one who, by virtue of an appointment, fulfills the office or the work of a deacon. And that's in a very special sense in a local church. And so maybe the way that we could say that would be like this, that all Christians are servants, but not all servants are deacons at least not in the sense that we think about in a local church. Now, as with almost everything in religion, there are some false concepts and misconceptions that have arisen about around this work as well. And so we need to expose a myth and we need to clarify. We need to clarify a concept. Now, the most common misperception among our denominational friends about the word deacon is that it has been, it's been taken it's been taken and combined with the role of an elder, and now they have kind of a hybrid office where you have a board of directors that basically serve as administrators or managers of a church. Now, that's an elevation of a deacon that God didn't intend it, and yet at the other extreme, we don't want to minimize in any way what God said the work of a deacon is designed ultimately to be. But there's also a misconception sometimes among our brethren regarding deacons, and the most common one is that somehow, some way, deacons are in training for the eldership. And I think that's a very commonly held misperception, misunderstanding among our brethren. That somehow, some way, you get to be appointed as a deacon and you do a really, really good job. And then you get a promotion one day and you get to become an elder. That the deacon is just a feeder office for the eldership. Now, there are a lot of problems with that, and we don't need to spend a lot of time with that. But, I mean, obviously, some things will be true here. The deacon, deaconate is an office unto itself, and there's no doubt about that. The fact is that a man might serve as a, serve as a deacon for the remainder of his life and never serve as an elder, and that would be just fine. Because he might lack the very character traits that are necessary to serve as a shepherd, an elder, an overseer in a local church. And in particular, that character trait that he may lack would be the very first one. He may just not desire to do that work. And the work is a very different work than being a deacon. And so there are men who are wonderful deacons who do a, a phenomenal job in the areas to which they have been assigned and given authority to do their work who might not do a good job at all as a, as a leader, as a shepherd, as an overseer, because that's just not their particular gift or ability or skill set. And then fourth, that's just a wrong view of the church. I mean, that's a view of a church where, where we see things as kind of a corporate ladder. And again, you get to be a deacon, you do a good job, and then you get, you get a promotion to be an elder. Now, the fact of the matter is that sometimes, oftentimes, elders do come from serving as a deacon. And so the two men that we just appointed in our church family, Jay and Barry, had served with distinction as deacons in our congregation. And so while that may happen, the point is simply that it does not have to happen that way. Remember that this is an office and work unto itself. Do you have a Bible this morning? I want you to read with me this morning in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6. Now, I need to give you a disclaimer about what I'm about to read. I certainly realize that, that not all consider these men to be deacons in the sense that we talk about deacons in 2021. I honestly don't know. I do know that the noun deacon is not used in Acts 6, but I also know that the verb in verse 2, wait on tables or to minister or to serve, is from the same root that we get our word deacon. But here's my point in looking at Acts 6, that whether these were exactly the men that we think of in 2021 or not, the circumstance and the work parallel what we do today. And that's the point, that the circumstance and the work parallel very much what we look for and what we need today. So let's read the passage and at least see those principles here. All right. So in Acts 6 and beginning in verse 1, this is familiar territory. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, 
there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Well, then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we, we will give ourselves continually to prayer. know what happened. In verse number four, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The same pleased the whole multitude. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And then there were six others. And in verse six, they set the, uh, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient, obedient to the faith. And here's what I want us to see from that particular passage. That when you look at that, and you look at these special servants, there are three things that become very, very clear. One is that there was a work of delegation here. That their work was delegated to them by the apostles. Just as deacons in 2021, we okay for me to move? Thank you. Just as in 2021, the work of deacons is delegated by bishops, by shepherds, by overseers in a local church. And so the delegation principle is seen in that they said, you choose these men and we will appoint them. We will appoint them over this business. Now, the guiding principle here, and don't miss this, is that they were appointed over a certain aspect of the business that needed to be done. And that way, the apostles were free to do what was of greater importance to them, in particular, as they saw it, the ministry of prayer and of the word. And so, in a local church, if you think about it, the role of elders is primarily to serve as shepherds who watch for souls and who one day will give an account for the souls under their charge as they shepherd the flock of God. And to leave that work in order to care for other matters that deacons can care for with equal skill, equal expertise, equal ability, equal effectiveness would just not be proper. Now, what we also deduce from that is that every deacon must have a clearly defined responsibility and secondly, the authority to do that work. Let me say that again. Every deacon should have a clearly defined responsibility and the authority to do that work. You know, deacons should be appointed, ladies and gentlemen, to meet a need. I have been familiar with many churches around this nation who've taken a different approach to that, where they simply appoint men to be deacons and then they try to find them a job. Imagine that in the secular realm. Imagine that you interview for a job and your interviewer says, man, we really do like you. We're, we're going to hire you. We're going to give you a job. And you say, great. What exactly am I going to be doing? And the interviewer says, we don't really know. We haven't figured that out yet. But I tell you what, you hang tight for a few weeks and we'll figure that out. And then we'll tell you what you're going to do. That's not what happened in the first century. Clearly, at least in this case, individuals were appointed to do a work and they knew from the beginning what that work was going to be. That, by the way, is the practice that is fashioned or is followed in our church family. And then secondly, there was an issue of discernment. Discernment. And you see that in verse 3 as well. And that is the idea that they would be, they would be <clears throat> men of, who are full of wisdom. And then third is the word duty. They were over this business. And so these were men of discernment. And these were men who were over a certain business. Now, the discernment is that they would be full of wisdom. That was important that they have that. It's important that deacons today be men of discernment. In Acts 6, those men had to discern several things. They had to, they had to discern whether or not a need actually existed. 
They had to discern whether or not the need was a legitimate need that needed to be addressed. They had to discern whether or not the need that needed to be addressed, if there were means that existed to meet that need. They had to determine where they were going to purchase those means to meet the need. And then they would have to discern how best to distribute those means to make sure that things were equitable and fair and done in a proper way. And then the duty was that they were over that business. This was their job. It was assigned to them by the apostles. In a local church, of course, shepherds, elders, overseers, they assign many things to deacons. In our church family, it's, it's a long list. After the pattern of Acts chapter 6, there are benevolent things that have to be tended to. Often in Acts 6, it was widows, but still today, benevolent needs. Our deacons help a great deal with that. We have in deacons who care for special needs among, <clears throat> among our members. Then the building and grounds and technology and uh, various aspects that they help the shepherds with in regard to the Bible class program. And then our, our group program, our work group program, finances and visitor greeting, audio visual, special needs, scheduling those who are going to serve, all of these things and many more come into play in that. And so the point is there was delegation and discernment and there was duty. Now, I want us to take a few minutes in the minutes that we have left. And let's talk just a little bit. Oh, I want you to notice also, I almost forgot. In this passage, I want you to notice what the upshot of this was in uh, Acts 6. It is that when this pattern was followed, the word of God spread, the number of disciples multiplied, many priests were obedient to the faith. In other words, God's pattern produced a good result. And it will still today. I want us to take the few minutes that we have left and let's just talk about how we discern the character that God is looking for as we select these special servants. Now we're going to 1 Timothy chapter 3. If you want to open there in your Bible, we're going to put these on the screen as well in a moment. But 1 Timothy 3 is where these will come from. And it's important to note, that when, to note that when you read this list, you will immediately be struck. If you were with us in the lessons that we taught regarding the eldership, you will immediately notice that the list of character traits that are given by Paul to Timothy for deacons is different. It's not the same as those given for shepherds. The criteria for service is not as stringent. The standard is not as high. Well, why? Well, because the nature of the work is different. And so there is a different standard of eligibility. Now, before we look at 1 Timothy 3, if we were just to go back for a second to Acts 6, there are three things that the apostles said needed to be criteria there, and they're good criteria today as well. One is that these, these should be men of good reputation. These should be men of good reputation, not merely good men, but men who are known for being good men, men of good reputation who are full of the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that they had, the mirac they had miraculous abilities given them by the Holy Spirit because that would not be necessary to the fulfillment of their job. I take that to be that these were men who were living the fruit of the Spirit. You could see in their life, the fruit of the Spirit had not only been developed, but it was being, it was being shown in the way that they lived their life. Love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, God, all those things in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And then third, they had to be full of wisdom. Maybe in the South, we would phrase, they got to be men of common sense. Again, because if you think about what we said a moment ago, there are a variety of things that they had to discern. And so given responsibility and having the wisdom, the common sense to do the work would be essential. Because without that, poor decisions would be made. Bad judgment would be exercised. Things would not be done effectively or efficiently. And harm would be done to the work. So let's think for just a minute about the test of proven character that we have in 1 Timothy 3. And again, these are different than what we looked at in regard to the shepherds because the nature of the work is different. But when you read 1 Timothy 3, there are some traits of proven character that God says have to be in place for those who are going to serve in a New Testament church as these special servants. So let's talk about them. On the negative side of the equation, <clears throat> there are some things like this. He cannot be double-tongued. He can't be double-tongued, Paul said. 
Literally, he can't be too worded, which is what that means. He can't be too worded. He's not one who says, you know what? I'll do that. I'll take care of that. I'll get back to you on that. And then he doesn't do it. He can't be someone who does, who says one thing at one time and says another thing at another time. And he can't be someone who doesn't, by virtue of his words, have the ability to work with the shepherds, the elders, the overseers in the local church. Elders should never have to worry about deacons pledging their support while at the same time working to undermine those very shepherds that they pledge to support and help. They can't be double-tongued. And secondly, they can't be given to much wine. Now, if you've listened to me preach very long, you know, you know that I don't believe that the use of alcohol is justified in the life of a child of God. I look at a passage like 1 Timothy 5 and 23, where Paul told Timothy and said, look, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. I look at that and say, look, if everybody understood that drinking wine was okay, that it wasn't a problem, then why did Paul have to specify and give a special exemption to Timothy? And so I realize that some have tried to look at this and make a play here for the acceptability of alcohol in the life of a Christian. I don't see that. The work of a deacon requires clear thinking. And on toxicants, it seems to me you're out of the question with that. And remember that a deacon is to be a man of a good reputation. I can tell you the leadership of this church, the leadership of this church is committed to the fact that we will do nothing. We will do nothing that could influence others, especially young people to begin a practice that might well lead them to a course of spiritual destruction. And third, he says you can't be greedy for money. Not greedy for money. The New American Standard Bible has the phrase, not fond of sordid gain. And so that would mean that any kind of questionable or dishonest method of gaining income would be forbidden. And it would mean that any kind of job that might bring disrespect to the Lord's church, to the people of God would be forbidden. And it would mean that a deacon must be somebody who handles his money with integrity, pays his bills, pays his debts, because that's a matter of integrity. You know, the Bible provides just a laundry list of individuals who failed the money test. People like Balaam and Gehazi, Judas Iscariot, who all failed the money test. They love money more than they love God. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, if a deacon is greedy for money, he will never put the Lord's work first. Earning and having and acquiring will always take precedence in his life. It was Zwingli who said, if I possess something that I cannot part with, then I do not possess it. It possesses me. It's a good way of thinking about that. Now, here's the positive side of the equation. On the positive side of the equation, Paul says a deacon must be blameless. Now we talked about that phrase in regard to shepherds several weeks ago. Another translation has that he must be of good report. And we talked about the fact with shepherds that blameless is kind of one of those umbrella traits that all of these other things as he meets these criteria show that he's of good report in this area. It doesn't mean that he can't be criticized. The Lord Jesus was criticized, but it means that no accusation of an enemy can be sustained. And so he must be of blameless or above reproach, above reproach in character and reputation. And he must be reverent. Uh, One translation says he must be a man of dignity. He must be serious. The point of it is that there is a seriousness about his work. It's a time of fun and frivolity for everybody. But a person who can never get serious about anything and can't be serious about the work, the task that he is to do, then he simply is not qualified to serve. And then there is the test of family relationship. And these are different than for a shepherd as well. Now, one thing that is the same is that he must be a husband of one wife. A husband of one wife. Interesting phrase. We talked about that in regard to shepherds. That that would forbid both celibacy and polygamy. Literally, it is of one wife, a husband. And the point that's trying to be made is that this is an individual who is married and he is devoted and dedicated to his wife. He is scripturally married and dedicated, devoted to his wife. And then the text says that he must rule his children and his own house 
Well, now again, that's different than what we talked about in regard to a shepherd. Because in regard to a shepherd, this individual must have, he must have a child or children who believe, that is, who are Christians. But there's a difference in criteria here because there's a difference in work. And so these children are not said to have to be believers or Christians. And this is why oftentimes deacons in a local church are younger men. Now, that's not always the case. There is nothing in Scripture that prohibits an older individual from being able to serve. But generally, deacons in a local church are younger men. But again, not always. Uh, there is a congregation where I've held countless gospel meetings in the last 40 years. And uh, not long ago, they appointed a man to be a deacon who was in his 70s. Well, why? Well, because they were about to embark on a project for the church where this man had spent his life, his vocational life, developing expertise, and he was the perfect choice to oversee this work that was going to take about a year or two years, and he was perfectly suited to that by his life experience and training, and so he was appointed to that work. At the end of those two years, he simply set aside. Now, in many ways, that's a good biblical example. But oftentimes, again, it's younger men, younger men who fill these roles. Well, how old do these kids need to be? Well, he doesn't say, but old enough to properly demonstrate fulfillment of the command. And then Paul turns his attention to the wife of a deacon. And he says, likewise, their wives must be reverent. The word is dignified, not running to extremes, serious in demeanor, in outlook, self-respecting in their conduct, not domineering, not overbearing, not frivolous or unconcerned or immature. They must be reverent and they must not be slanderers. Some translations say not malicious gossips. That is, a deacon's wife cannot be, to use Peter's language, a busybody in other people's matters. They can't be somebody who have their, their life, their nose in other people's business. She must not be, what is the common, must not be a talker. Must not be someone who prefaces conversations with words like this. Look, I know I shouldn't be telling you this, but. Or don't tell anybody I told you this, but. And she must not be a sounding board for the gossip of others. And one other aspect about that, that is in play in the modern world. And that is, I would say that she must be very, very careful about what she's going to post to social media to make sure that she is not posting things that are going to be divisive with some of the brethren in the church family, or that she is not posting things that are of dubious credibility, dubious truthfulness, that she is not investigated to find out and make sure that what she is posting is the absolute truth. Those things her husband cannot overcome. And she must be temperate, that is sober, balanced, able to control her attitude and tongue and actions, and faithful in all things, in the church, in her home, in a relationship with others. And then one final thought, and that is <clears throat> that there is a test of experience. And I want you to notice what Paul said about the test of experience. He said, this individual must hold the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. Now, I don't know what you see when you see that, ladies and gentlemen. What I see is that Paul's saying, this is a man of some maturity. This is a man who's been around God for a while. He's been around the Bible for a while. He is a man of some spiritual maturity. I want us to work from the back of that sentence to the front. So let's take it in reverse order. So he begins and he says, or he ends by saying, this must be an individual of a pure conscience, a pure conscience. That is, this is somebody who deports himself in such a way as to give testimony that he not only believes, but he lives undiluted truth. And the truth that he believes and lives is referred to in this verse as the faith. The faith that is once for all, Jude said, delivered unto the saints. And that faith that he believes and lives, he is going to hold, 
which is an extremely important word. It means that this is the way he lives his life, without reservation, about the totality of God's truth. He has an adequate understanding of the Word of God that guides his life and guides his judgment. And the point of it is that we're dealing with a mature person here. Now again, that's not always a matter of chronology. It's not always a matter of how many birthday candles you blow out. Oftentimes it's a matter of the home you grew up in, the experience that you've developed, the way that you lived your life, and your own personal commitment to God. But we're dealing with a man who is mature. And that's why the final trait that we'll look at is that he says, let these first be tested. Let these first be tested. And so this is an individual that his fellow Christians can look to. And he can see these traits of character, these family traits, these personal traits. And say, yes, I see those. I see those in this person. Let me just say a word about that, if I may. The point of it is that these men need to exhibit the character and the quality that these verses require before they are allowed to serve. Before they are allowed to serve. Now, again, there's a congregation where I've held numerous gospel meetings through the years. And they have a very different philosophy about that. They've kind of forgotten that last phrase that we have on the screen. And so their philosophy has been that they will take a man in their congregation who is not doing well spiritually at all. And so he's struggling spiritually. He's not doing well. Maybe he's not worshiping or he's not leading his family. He's just not doing very well spiritually at all. And they will make him a deacon. And their hope is that making him a deacon will make him a better person. How do you reckon that's worked out? That's been a disaster over and over and over and over again. Because the God-ordained pattern is that them first be tested. As we said in regard to elders and shepherds and overseers, that when you begin to select and appoint additional men to serve as a shepherd in the congregation, what do you look for? You look for a man who's already shepherding. You don't appoint a man and then just hope and pray that he's going to become a shepherd. It doesn't work that way. And when you're looking for special servants in the kingdom of God, what kind of man do you look for? You look for a man who's already finding ways to serve. When we did the lessons regarding the elders, overseers, and shepherds, we told you, we told you about Sewell Hall. I heard Sewell Hall say in a sermon once that, <clears throat> that, that he's heard so many year, men through the years say, I want to, I'd like to move overseas and do evangelism and live and do evangelistic work overseas. And Brother Hall's question always is, what are you doing now? Because if you're not evangelistically minded now, if you're not doing evangelistic work now, there is nothing about flying over salt water that's going to make you evangelistic. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. What kind of man are you looking for? In the first part of 1 Timothy, you're looking for a man who's already shepherding. And in the last part, when he's talking about deacons, you look for a man who's already serving, finding ways to be of service to the kingdom of God, to his fellow man, to his family, and to others. We're so blessed in our church family. So here we are at Temple Terrace, and we've got 14 wonderful shepherds, and we have got 19 special servants at this time. And now today we begin the process of selecting and appointing additional men to serve in this role. Usually we would distribute these selection cards after our one service, but since we are divided in our assemblies now and because we still have a percentage of our members who are not able to worship with us and are watching on live stream, we will do as we did with the shepherd cards. And these have already been mailed. They were mailed yesterday. And so you should, every member of our church family should receive this card either tomorrow or Tuesday, probably. And if you don't receive that card in the next few days, please reach out to us and we'll make sure that you get one. And so on this card, there are three lines that simply say, in addition to the men currently serving as deacons, I believe the following men are also qualified to serve. There's a second line that says, I do not believe there are any additional men qualified to serve as deacons at this time. 
And there is a third line that says, I have not been a member of this congregation long enough to express a judgment about this matter. And then there's a place for you to sign, to sign the card and to return it to us by April the 11th. There will be, there will be uh, reception <clears throat> boxes on both of the doors and also in the foyer beginning Wednesday night. And you have until April the 11th, two weeks from today, to submit your cards. When we went through the process for the selection and the appointment of additional shepherds, we had such wonderful cooperation from our church family. And we know you'll do the same with this. God's plan works. We are living illustrations of the fact that God's plan works. And so we ask you to think, but more than that, we ask you to pray about this. That our choices, our selections will simply reflect the will and the plan of God. And we pray that we will do this carefully, prayerfully, and be grateful, dear God. Be grateful for the good men who serve us now and for the good men who will come on board to help us for the future. Thank you for listening so well this morning. Again, this is so different than what we typically do on a Sunday morning, but thank you for listening well. We hope that it'll be beneficial for our church family. It's critical for those of you that are visiting with us. We hope that it gives some insight into this particular part of God's plan for his people. It may be that you're in this audience this morning. You know, we said in all the lessons in regard to shepherding, to those who would be shepherds and elders and overseers, we said in all of those lessons that every elder began in the, in the exact same way. And every deacon does as well. We all begin at the same place. We all begin in the water of baptism. Everybody. And we all begin as babies. Newborn babies in Christ. And if that's you today, I mean, if this is the day that you got up and said, you know what? I've been thinking about this a long time, and today's the day that I'm going to become a Christian. We would love to help you with that. And so if there's a response to God that you need to make in a public way today, and we can help you, please let us. Let's stand and let's sing.